Well, we're back in our wheelhouse, back from all that sidetracking, and for our 40th game review, it's The Fool's Errand. Yeah, this is an Atari ST version. I couldn't find a physical Macintosh copy. Good luck with that one. I got an Atari and Amiga copy, which I'll talk about, but I'm mostly focusing on the original Macintosh version. Get ready, puzzle fiends. This is the first time we'll be scaling the mental cliffs of the one and only Cliff Johnson. The Fool's Errand was developed by Cliff Johnson and published for the Macintosh in 1987 by Miles Computing, later to be ported to Amiga, Atari, and DOS in 1989. Which makes yet another game I'm reviewing that's older than I am. Now before we start, I have to say one thing. I hate you, Cliff Johnson. And that now, before you start booing me here, there is some context to this. Cliff Johnson's website accounts tales of when he attended the Macworld Expo back in 1988 and 1991 to promote The Fool's Errand and 3 and 3, respectively, that people marched up, pointed right at him, and shouted, I hate you. And to quote the website directly, It was the ultimate compliment. Puzzle-addled students hated me because they were too tired to study for their exams. Business professionals hated me because they were blurry-eyed on the job. And even a pair of newlyweds hated me because I ruined their honeymoon. That's probably why I'll never have a girlfriend. Well, one of many reasons, anyway. So I'll understand if you feel the need to email me and say, I hate you. So when I say that, I really do mean it in the best possible way. Of course, my hatred mostly comes from this being a really weird game to actually review. Hence why I've been putting it off for so long. Because to review a puzzle game, you have to talk about the game without talking in detail about the game. So, you can't really talk about specific puzzles without spoiling the very point of a puzzle game. Okay, first things first, to figure out where I am. The mouse looked over the cliff, only to be greeted by a talking sun. Perhaps this map will help you. The mouse looked at it with confusion. It's just a few square pieces, how is this supposed to... When he looked again, the sun was gone. Great, I've got a jumbled fourth of a map and story segments that jump around more than Kit with a stuck turbo boost button. Now what? Yeah, if you forget to watch the prologue, like I did, that's literally your introduction to the story as being given 21 out of 81 of the sun's map pieces, a bunch of jumbled disconnected story segments, and a bunch of menus. If you don't have the original manual, you'd be forgiven for being a little lost here. The original Macintosh game comes on two discs, the game disc, which has the program and puzzles, and the show disc, which has the prologue and, when you complete the game, the finale. It's also not copy protected, which unfortunately was taken advantage of. You could argue that's the case with every game, I mean, see my Mind Over Mac review for proof of that one, but Cliff Johnson stated in an interview that the game was outsold by the hint book that he created for it. Gee, I wonder why the other versions come with a code wheel. This game is pretty nifty for 1987. You can switch puzzles and your progress in your earlier puzzle will be saved, and once you make a save file, it will automatically save when you quit, since there's no way to mess up your game in a title like this. Still, the manual recommends you save every so often, lest a power surge ruin your day. Just ask the three of three and three. Wait, what? Cliff Johnson made a later edit to the manual? Damn it, I was gonna make that joke. It's not even in this version of the manual. Cliff Johnson literally stole my joke. You magnificent bastard, I read your book! Anyways, the manual makes a point that there's no way to die or fail the fool's errand and tells you how the story is important for several reasons, but we'll get to those. There's a total of, I believe, 58 puzzles to unlock the remaining pieces of the sun's map. Every piece of the story has a corresponding map piece, and each story segment hints at where that piece should go. The story, in short, is that the Fool is seeking the 14 treasures of the land, which have all gone missing thanks to the evils of the High Priestess. This is throwing the land into chaos, making people act strangely, and bringing the kingdoms of wands, pentacles, swords, and cups to the brink of war. If you couldn't already tell, the whole story is strung together from the Rider Waite tarot deck, and as strange as that idea sounds, Cliff Johnson does actually manage to make it work, and the Fool plays humorously into all the seemingly nonsense things happening in the story. Whether that be playing the straight man to it, not understanding that the context is meant for solving the map or some other puzzle, 
rather than how hard the actual path itself is to walk, or just going into situations with literal thinking, sometimes into troll logic levels. He followed the cobblestone road and discovered that it ended at the entrance to a maze of tall hedges. I would not go in there if I were you, warned a woman tending to a garden of nine star-shaped flowers. No one has ever found their way out. Well, the mouse pondered, since you are not me, then it must mean that I should go in there. He disappeared into the maze and very quickly found his way to the exit. Yes, that is verbatim from the story. Well, aside from one little change. Now I'm doing the Macintosh version for good reason. It's the version Cliff Johnson himself recommends. Yeah, the other versions have color graphics and I believe some music and sound, but the game was made in the silhouette style specifically because it fit the Macintosh. Oh, and quick tidbit, the style was inspired by the adventures of Prince Ahmed. To directly quote Johnson, the MS-DOS conversion felt to me like a bizarro world counterpart. Keep in mind I spent nearly two years perfecting a look and feel that took best advantage of the Mac's high resolution black and white. To then see the game close up in gaudy IBM colors and chunky oblong pixels gave me the willies. But viewed from 15 feet away, it looks okay. Kinda. To that I say I definitely agree, although I might be slightly biased. Sound and music isn't exactly very important for this game anyways. Monochrome graphics do make the tile puzzles slightly harder, but those aren't the puzzles that you're going to have trouble with. Trust me on this one. Alright, I'm going over puzzle types and then I'm going to go into spoiler territory, because it's just about impossible to talk about one's personal experience with this game without being a little bit spoilery. You have word scramble puzzles, which generally follow a common theme, and same with the word search puzzles, including one themed around countries that includes both Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia. Oops. All the queen puzzles are word squares, which have to be arranged so that all the rows and columns make a word. These are confusing. There's also a few word puzzles where the phrase is hidden inside the image somehow. There's the tile puzzles I mentioned before, which can be a little difficult, like when you're assembling a monochrome ocean. Then you have jigsaw sorts of puzzles, which make phrases when you're finished. You have several cipher puzzles, which require you to decode a message, usually with a starting point. Usually. If not, then you have to try and match frequent appearances with common letters as a starting point. You have a few mazes, which you literally have to feel your way around. You can only see a wall once you've pushed against it. These introduce things like teleporters and items later on as well. These I don't even know what you call... additive puzzles? These are also recurring, and each button will add to the image, or subtract if something is already there. I don't know, I kept pressing buttons until it looked like I was getting somewhere. Last is these strange decryption puzzles. Each of these buttons does a certain thing to the current phrase, add or subtract letters to the beginning or end, replace characters with something else, flip it around, and only one combination of these makes a proper phrase. Mashing will only get you so far, because these start with five buttons, but once you get to the dream, you have eight buttons. Alright, time for some math, and don't freak out on me here, this is relatively simple. The number of possibilities for these puzzles is the number of buttons factorial. 4 factorial is 24, 5 factorial is 120, 6 factorial is 720, 7 factorial is 5,040, and 8 factorial is 40,320. 40,320 combinations of which one is correct. I spent three hours poring over notes of what each individual button did for this puzzle. Three hours for one puzzle. Did I mention I did this with no walkthrough? I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but those are all the recurring puzzles. The remainder of puzzles are mostly dexterity based actually, which is definitely odd and nothing like a puzzle book. I bet that wasn't in Cliff's original puzzle book. Alright, oh, I almost forgot. 
Part of the original inspiration for this game came from Johnson making a 20-page puzzle book, of which he made dozens of and sent off to his friends and family. Only three actually ended up solving the whole thing to spell out the phrase, Merry Christmas. That is one heck of a Christmas card. Also, Cliff Johnson, if you're watching this, you don't know what I'd give to see the complete version of that book. These dexterity puzzles are another reason I recommend the Mac version, by the way. A Scottish YouTube channel, Aikufu, reviewed the DOS version and... Yeah, playing these sections with that kind of mouse control? No thanks. There's one other puzzle that's not like any of the others, though. The Wheel of Fortune. No, not that Wheel of Fortune. It's a card game. A card game that doesn't explain any of the rules to you. Unless you want to try and be patient and figure this out, or look up a scoring table, good luck. I tried to be patient and take notes, and then eventually got frustrated and clicked until I ended up winning, so... Can't really help you on that one. Also, I must talk about one last thing before I hit spoilers, because I don't think anywhere but Cliff Johnson's website says much about this. There was a planned CD release of The Fool's Errand to be released in 1990, with all new graphics and all new puzzles, down to the sun's map and the final 14 treasures being different. The game was planned to be compatible for both monochrome and color max, and use the same color blending that would end up being a part of 3 and 3. Sadly, we're probably never going to see this cancelled project be released, but we at least have Brad Parker and Cliff Johnson's work to look at. A glimpse into what might have been. No sense stalling any longer, the mouse said aloud to no one in particular. Time to solve all of these puzzles, break these enchantments, and collect the pieces of the sun's map. Those 14 treasures are my key to getting out of this place. Alright, here's how the mostly spoiler-free segment ends. You can skip to here if you want, and I'll try not to spoil too many solutions, but the sun's map is going to be visible, and I am going to talk about some things more in depth, so if you want to play this for yourself, I'd skip to the end, or watch the rest of this later. Part of what makes The Fool's Errand different from a typical puzzle game is the meta-puzzle narrative. The game isn't just a string of puzzles, each puzzle unlocks a bit more of the story, another piece of the sun's map. It reduces a little bit of the grind of the puzzles, which is good, as aside from some specific puzzles, they fall into typical categories. Several of the puzzles did do things only possible on a computer, though, especially the enchantments, some of which require manipulation with the keyboard or drop-down menus, and that was when this stuff was still new, making things even more diabolical than on first glance. Other puzzles have the solution hidden in the picture, or have you hover the mouse over certain places to find the solutions. Some of the puzzle solutions are themselves clues on how to solve the other puzzles, like the Devil Cipher puzzle solution gives a clue on how to solve the Three Ships puzzle, and the High Priestess puzzle will require you to remember solutions from the previous enchantments. No matter who you are, though, it's going to take hours upon hours to complete all the puzzles, if you do at all. You'll finally have all the pieces of the Sun's map, have the whole story, and then remember you still have to put the whole thing together. So that's probably going to be another couple of hours, unless you were smart and tried to assemble the map as you go. Which... I wasn't. Oops. So, you completed all the puzzles and finally assembled the sun's map. You're still not done, now you have to find the 14 treasures of the land, remember? That's right, all of that work was just to put together the grand final puzzle. This is where you'll be using the hints through the story and on the map. Oh, and I hope you like word scramble and decryption puzzles, because that's a lot of the puzzles here. Well, there's also the crossword solved with the clues in the story and on the map. Figuring out what to do isn't too bad, though. Confused means you need to unscramble, disguised means you need to decrypt, and sometimes you have to do both. Then, after solving this story within a story, you finally get your finale, which appears in your Fool's Errand folder after you complete the game.
Now, kudos to the walkthrough at balmoralesoftware.com for this one. Yeah, I didn't use a walkthrough, but I still referenced one for the sake of this review. Also, holy crap, this online walkthrough was made in 1998. Ah, old internet. Anyways, on the final riddle, the fool gives the answer as the Book of Thoth. However, this is wrong, and purposely so, as this was the fool's plan. If you do letter replacements according to the capital letters, you get a different set of letters, which can be descrambled to make out the phrase death to the fool, which probably means the high priestess was going to try and kill the fool either way. Even at the end of the game, there's still something to be found. Well played, Cliff Johnson. Alright, so whether you watched all that or you skipped to here, it's conclusion time. The Fool's Errand, even 30 years after its release, is still something I think Puzzle Fiend should pick up and play right now. Everyone else? I'd give it a try because hey, why not? But be warned that it is not an easy playthrough. Cliff Johnson weaves the puzzles of the Fool's Errand together into an experience that's more than just solving a bunch of puzzles. And on a personal note, it's stuff like this that gives you the mentality on archival that I do. Buy the games and support the author when you can, but make sure that what you have never gets lost to that horrible ether, that encroaching shroud of time. That way things like this can be enjoyed even after another 30 years. That's probably the best note that I could end this review on, really. Up next is... Well, I'm actually not entirely sure, if anything. If I do continue with this, I hope that the next four years of Gamer Mouse are more productive than the last four have been. Whatever happens, though, game on. Cliff Johnson is age 33, much to his surprise. He survived high school in Connecticut by convincing the faculty that making Super 8 movies was a viable substitute to good grades. He subsequently found himself building fiberglass monsters for five of the nation's amusement parks, all but two of which have been condemned. He attended the USC School of Cinema and can now claim to have personally known several famous film directors. His three years as a teaching assistant in film animation led him to the field of instructional films, directing and producing such notable works as heating, air conditioning, and ventilation, and other film classics. In his spare moments, he writes treasure hunts and mystery games strictly on an outpatient basis. Cliff is a newcomer to computer programming and his wife regrets every minute of it.